Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I just want to tell you a bit about the US Corporate Law course. I believe it's an optional module, is that yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They so, do four from six, four modules out of six. They can choose four to six. So. so this is a bit of a, a beauty contest then. I'm trying to sell the module to you, so I'll do my best. Uh, now, first of all, uh, why am I qualified to teach this topic? Because you've as you probably noticed, I'm not from the United States. I'm actually from Scotland. <laughs> Uh, so why should you learn US corporate law from me? Uh, as Brian said, I've taught for a number of years, I've taught Anglo-American corporate law and governance uh, at a couple of institutions in this country. Uh, I've also taught corporate law at JD level in the United States. Uh, and uh, I've written extensively in US corporate law. So even though I'm based in, in the UK, my interests are as much, if not more, on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, hence the fact I teach this topic. Uh, more to the point, why should you study US corporate law? You opted to go to Cambridge, not Columbia. So why should you study US corporate law in England? Uh, a number of reasons. Uh, even though you're doing your graduate studies in England, some of you may go on to practice law in the US. Very good reasons, not least financial reasons for doing so. Therefore, corporate law, US corporate law can equip you well for doing that. Uh, even if you don't opt to practice law in the United States, uh, if you are, going into a corporate specialism, undoubtedly, or at least there's a very good chance that uh, you will be required to engage with US corporate law at some point in your professional life, uh, particularly when it comes to issues like uh, shareholders' rights or remedies, where US law, particularly US federal law, can have a quite profound international effect, not least because certain aspects of US federal law have extraterritorial effect, uh, so can apply overseas. Uh, also, US corporate law is highly influential, as you're probably aware, as an international point of reference, whatever country you ultimately practice law in. Uh, many countries opt for good reasons or less good reasons to mimic aspects of both US and indeed UK law uh, for their own legal systems. So knowing about US law is important from that point of view, uh, from, a, from a legal evolution or law reform point of view. Uh, and also, uh, a company, wherever it's situated in the world, in terms of its operations, can choose to become a US corporation. You don't have to conduct your business in the US to become a US corporation. Uh, you can opt to basically adopt elements of US corporate law wherever you choose to conduct business. Uh, and finally, a more general point, we live in a largely, for better or worse, we live in a largely US-dominated global political economy. The US corporation exercises a profound influence over our lives on a daily basis, whether we know it or not. So knowing a bit about US corporations, how they're regulated, how they're structured, how they're operated, is interesting, I think, for all of us on that level. Now, US corporate law is a highly interesting system of law, uh, not just because it's high profile, but because of the way it's actually constructed. Uh, and it's also a highly unique system of law as well. Not least because there is no such thing as US corporate law, really, even though we use that term. The US corporate law system is actually 51 different systems of law, or if we include the federal level, 52 systems of law, all rolled into one. So you have each, you have 50 systems of law for each of the states of the United States. You have another system of law for the District of Columbia, uh, where Washington is situated. And then you have a federal level of laws, overlaying all the state laws and principally US corporate law is actually state based rather than federal based. Uh, now uh, there's a very important principle of US corporate law that's important to understand from a very early stage and we will be emphasising it at an early stage in the course which is called the internal affairs doctrine which basically it's basically it's best described as a kind of quasi constitutional principle to the effect that Aspects of internal corporate law, and incidentally, in the US, we tend to use the word corporate rather than company law. Both terms mean the same thing, really, but we use the word corporate more than the English term company. But the internal affairs doctrine basically dictates that uh, matters of corporate law, in other words, uh, rules, principles governing the internal structure and operation of the firm, things like director's duties, shareholders' rights, these issues should be governed at state level, not at federal level. 
Issues external to corporate law, such as securities law, for example, can legitimately be governed at federal level and are governed at federal level. And most securities laws come from Washington, D.C. and apply to the country as a whole. But corporate law, internal corporate or company law, should come from individual states. And there's a lot of very valid economic and political reasons for that, which we'll explain in the course. So that's an important thing to know. Uh, and uh, so the US is a federal system of corporate law. And this throws up a number of very interesting features because it means a US corporation can incorporate in any of the 50 plus one states. Uh, and uh, what this also means, another curious feature of US corporate law is this means that all of the, I'm going to say 51 states because DC is included as a state, all of the 51 states therefore compete with each other to offer companies and their investors the most seemingly attractive system of corporate law. And companies can choose, as I've said earlier, they can choose to incorporate and adopt the corporate law system of any one of those 51 states, regardless of where their operations are. So take a typical corporation in the US, its head office might be in New York City. Most of its upstream manufacturing operations might be in the Midwest, in somewhere like Ohio or Illinois and many of its downstream manufacturing activities might be spread throughout other parts of the world, for instance, across parts of Asia. It doesn't matter. Its corporate law, corporate law system is determined by its state of incorporation, regardless of whether or not it operates in that state on a physical level. And this makes US corporate law quite different from company law in, in the European Union. Because even though we sometimes erroneously think of the EU as being a bit like the United States of Europe, it's not really, it's not a very good analogy. Uh, but nonetheless, in the EU, we still largely stick to something called the wheel seat doctrine, which means that if you incorporate in a particular state in the EU, for example in Germany, then you should have your main place of operations in that country uh, to try and keep the physical reality of the company uh, uh, locked in with its legal identity. Uh, so, if we're going to study US, if we're going to study US corporate law, we have to rid ourselves of this notion that the physical company should be in the same place as the, the the company's place of incorporation. A company can be governed by a particular state's corporate law system, adopt that state's law, but operate elsewhere, and that's an important thing to grasp. And there's one particular state which has become dominant in the competition for incorporations. I should state there are very good reasons as to why individual states want companies to incorporate within their domain and adopt their corporate law system. It doesn't necessarily mean you get more business and jobs within that state, but what it does mean is you can, uh, you can make more money in the form of uh, incorporation fees and franchise taxes. Uh, which uh, companies pay to their state of incorporation. Does anybody know what the dominant state in America is? It's probably not one of the obvious ones you might think of. What is the dominant corporate law state in America? Delaware. Delaware, yeah. Uh, yeah, most people who don't know a lot about corporate law would probably say somewhere like New York or even Chicago, or I should say Illinois, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, Delaware. A little known state, but a state which has become highly specialised uh, in offering corporate law. In a way, corporate law is a product uh, and different states operate as corporate law shops. You can buy your laws from each of those states and Delaware happens to be a very attractive shop that companies and their investors and managers like to shop at when they buy their laws and that's a good way of thinking about it. Uh, so the key sources that we will be looking at in this course in terms of legal authorities, the main source that we'll be looking at uh, on a statutory level is the Delaware General Corporation Law. A majority of publicly traded US corporations are incorporated in Delaware. Now, the main focus of this course will be public corporations rather than uh, closely held or private companies. Uh, so Delaware will be far and away our main focus of attention. Uh, it won't be our exclusive focus of attention. There are other important sources as well. There's something called the Model Business Corporation Act which is the piece of company legislation that applies to most of the other states. Uh, the uh, other states in the United States, uh, well, basically the Model Business Corporation Act is, is something that's promulgated and updated by the American Bar Association. 
And it's basically a kind of cocktail of laws from all the other non-Delaware states put together in quite an authoritative way. And then what tends to happen is other non-Delaware states tend to evolve their own systems in line with the Model Business Corporation Act. And the Model Business Corporation Act is quite different from the Delaware statute, but not that different. There are quite strong similarities between the two. So in terms of state corporate law in America, Delaware General Corporation Law and the Model Business Corporation Act are the two main statutes that we tend to look at. And we will be looking at them in the course. We'll also be looking at a bit of federal law as well. Uh, federal securities law has quite a big impact on US corporate law, uh, particularly when it comes to disclosure obligations, what information the companies have to give out to their investors when they trade in a public market like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. And the main two acts that are applicable on a federal level are uh, the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, which were the big statutes uh, which were enacted by uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt's government uh, uh, during the, 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 uh, the Great Depression as part of the New Deal reforms. Uh, and they're still very much alive today. And the modern federal statutes that we've probably heard about in the US, like Sarbanes-Oxley from 2002 and Dodd-Frank from 2010, actually reform the 1933 and 1934 Acts. Uh, so all these reforms largely get, get, get incorporated in together in the early Act. Uh, we'll also be looking at case law. The vast majority of the case law we'll look at is Delaware case law. The Delaware courts are, I would say, without a doubt, the most highly specialised and expert corporate law courts in the world. Uh, they are corporate law courts, by and large. That's what they specialise at. They are wonderful at deciding uh, cases in real time. They can knock up, as far as I'm aware, some Delaware judges can, 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 can write up an enormous, maybe 70-page judgement over the space of a weekend, it seems, in some cases dealing with very, very highly complex points of mergers and acquisitions law. Uh, and they are very much attuned to the practical needs of publicly traded companies. Uh, so uh, it's a fascinating body of case law to look at. Uh, we'll also look at some federal cases and a limited amount of case law from other states, but Delaware will be our main focus of attention. Uh, we'll also look at a number of academic articles. What you find in US corporate law, much more so than in English company law, Delaware courts are very keen to adopt academic opinion within their judgments. English courts, I find, aren't so keen to adopt the views of people like Brian in their judgments. Arguably, they should be. But there's much more of a link between academic opinion and judicial opinion, I think, in the United States. Uh, and another important feature of US law that's very crucial to get your head around is, to a large extent, US corporate law operates as what's sometimes called enabling law. What that means is the law isn't there to command people to tell them what to do, like we conventionally understand regulation. The law in the corporate law in the United States is there to facilitate people's business activities. You can adopt laws or you can opt out of laws that don't suit you. Now that's something that's a bit alien to us even in the UK. In the UK our company law system has got certain aspects of soft enabling law. But by and large, the Companies Act in England is regulatory and mandatory. It doesn't leave you that much room for manoeuvre, I don't think. US law does offer you much more flexibility and room for manoeuvre, for better or worse. <coughs> Other important issues we'll look at. One of the big important themes in the early seminars will be the management of the corporation and how the board of directors operate. And those of you studying UK company law will be familiar with that already. But in US company law, corporate law I should say, particularly in Delaware, a very, very important principle that lies right at the heart of Delaware corporate law is something that you may have heard of called the business judgment rule. Uh, the business judgment rule is basically a judicial presumption to the effect that a board of a company, when they approve the decision of the company's management, they are presumed to have acted honestly uh, for the benefit of the company, uh, loyally for the company, and also on an informed basis, equipped with the requisite information. And unless that presumption can be rebutted by strong evidence to the contrary, which is almost never the case, 
the board, sorry, the court will protect the board's decision. And for that reason, the business judgment rule operates as an almost virtually watertight protection for the decisions of Delaware company boards of directors. So, Mark, we were actually just looking at the Disney case. Right, a cla um, this classic one. So, yeah. business judgment rule protection. We've done Shalensky and Wright as well. Right. Uh, yeah. Wrigley, Shalensky yeah. and Wrigley. So, yes. they, so, at least the ones, students who've done comparative corporate uh, yeah. Corporate governance, or know a little bit about it. Go yeah. ahead. Well, I'm yeah. preaching to the converted then. Uh, well, I, I, I will be talking about that in more detail uh, for those of you that want to hear more about it. Uh, but the business judgment rule is absolutely central to US corporate law. And uh, many people think of US corporate law as being a very shareholder orientated system because we think of the US system of financial capitalism as being about maximizing value for shareholders. And on a practical market level, maybe that's the case. But in terms of corporate law, corporate law isn't really shareholder orientated. It's much more managerially orientated in comparative terms. Managers get a lot more discretion and power uh, over their decisions than in the US than they would in other uh, countries. Uh, and that's one of the reasons as to why US corporate law from a managerial or director perspective is quite an attractive system of law to adopt, particularly Delaware law. One of the most interesting uh, areas where the business judgment rule is applied, uh, Schlensky and Wrigley is one of the classic cases, uh, obviously, uh, but one of the most interesting contexts in recent decades where the business judgment rule has operated has been in the context of hostile takeover bids. Uh, in the US, unlike the UK, the board of a target company can defend a bid. They can defend a hostile bid. So a hostile takeover bid, as you're probably aware, is a bid for the company, for control of the company, where the bidder or the offeror wants to acquire voting control of the company and the board of the target or offeree company do not want the transaction to go ahead. In the US, unlike the UK, the board can coercively defend the bid through a range of we weapons, structural weapons, uh, the most well known of which is something called a poison pill, which we can explain more about in the course. Uh, and the Delaware courts have been involved in very, very complicated, difficult judgments about the legitimacy of boards using poison pills. Uh, in the 80s, they invented something called the Unical Doctrine, which has been very helpful in enabling courts to decide these cases. Uh, there's also something called the Revlon Doctrine, which is an exception to the Unical Doctrine, uh, which is very important in this context as well, and we'll discuss both these principles. Uh, We'll also go on later in the course to look at the governance role of shareholders within the US corporation. And I do stress it is, by comparative standards, a very limited governance role which shareholders enjoy. Shareholders don't get the chance to do much, at least on a, if I could say, on a proactive level within US corporate law. Uh, one issue where shareholders are very uh, influential and powerful is uh, an area that Brian's written a lot about, which is ex post facto <coughs> shareholder rights uh, to use litigation against management, which we'll talk about in a minute. But when it comes to shareholders' rights to actually get involved in management decisions as they're being made, shareholders have their hands tied to quite a significant extent in the US, much more so, I should stress, than they do in the UK. Uh, and a fundamental legal principle of US corporate law alongside the business judgment rule is the board primacy rule, which basically means the board of directors have got decision-making primacy or supremacy, and shareholders should not get involved in management decisions. We have this rule to a large extent in UK company law as well, but it's not anywhere near as firmly entrenched, I don't think, as it is in the US. Uh, the main way that shareholders in the US can have an influence over corporate decisions is through something called the proxy process which is a federally regulated procedure, regulated by the, the securities regulator, the, the, the Securities and Exchange Commission of SEC. And under the SEC regulated proxy process, shareholders are given a formal opportunity to make proposals, which can then be voted on by shareholders in the company's annual meeting. Uh, and uh, these proposals can, there are a way in which shareholders can try to convince boards of US corporations to adopt certain policies or to do certain things that the shareholders think is desirable. The problem is there's not the, the shareholders' ability to do this is heavily constrained because 
Shareholders cannot make proxy proposals in the US relating to ordinary business matters. They cannot try to tell the board how to manage the company, because that is not the proper remit. Uh, and it's usually structural things that shareholders tend to make proxy proposals on. Uh, for example, uh, reforming the structure of the board of directors to make them more capable of being removed by shareholders is one classic example, which that's called destaggerization or declassification of the board. Or removal of poison pills or other coercive impediments to hostile takeover bids would be another thing that shareholders are often very keen to try and propose in meetings. And increasingly so in recent years, now that activist shareholders have become much more involved in corporate governance, challenging boards of directors. But nevertheless, the process is very heavily weighted in favour of the board and indirectly the managers who work under the board and vice versa, very heavily against the shareholders. The shareholders, in a way, in the US are always fighting against the wind uh, because the, legal, the, the laws that there are, are are quite heavily weighted against them. Now, some people say there's very good reasons for that because it's not shareholders' proper role to be getting involved, to be getting their hands dirty and getting involved in managing companies. Shareholders are investors. They entrust the board and the managers to run the company. And if they're not happy, they can always just sell their shares. And that's the traditional approach of, towards corporate governance in the US. Whereas in the UK, uh, we're much more willing, I think, or at least uh, comparatively more willing in the UK to allow shareholders uh, to, to, to have more of a say in the running of the company. Uh, so a final point we'll look at, one other thing we'll look at in the course incidentally is something called proxy contests, which is where uh, activist shareholders try to drum up support for ousting the board of the company without actually buying, controlling shareholding in the company. Uh, the best analogy is to think of it as a military coup of a dictator in a country. That's rather how proxy contests operate in the US, and we just don't see these sorts of things in the UK for reasons that we'll, we'll, we'll maybe explain if we have time in the course. And the final topic we'll look at is the one I've already mentioned, uh, the extensive role of litigation in the US corporate law system, shareholder litigation. Shareholders uh, can and frequently do uh, bring direct suits against the board of the company or against the management of the company under securities law, largely in the grounds of uh, misstatements that have been made in company disclosures, uh, and often get very, very large settlements as well uh, in the process. Uh, also, derivative action, actions brought by shareholders on behalf of the company against directors are much, much more common, much, much more common in US companies, particularly US public companies, than they are in the UK. I would say in UK public companies, derivative actions or derivative claims are virtually irrelevant. They happen so infrequently. Not the case in the US. And arguably the main reason as to why there's a big difference between the US and the UK when it comes to litigation is in the UK, litigation is principally led by shareholders. And shareholders don't tend to want to raise litigation for a variety of reasons. In the US, Shareholder litigation, somewhat ironically, is not led by shareholders. It's led by another group of important actors, namely attorneys. Civil procedure rules in the US give attorneys, give legal professionals, the power to actually instigate class actions against boards and managers of companies, something that isn't really possible in the UK, at least as of yet. And that's a big difference. And uh, in this topic, another very interesting issue that we'll pick up on is something, again, that's completely alien, really, in the UK, but very common in the US, which is called exculpation procedures. A board of a Delaware company, a director of a Delaware company, can, in effect, get themselves opted out of money damages liability for breach of duty of care. So if a Delaware director is held to have acted negligently by a court, which in itself is very, very uncommon, the chances are they will not be liable for money damages because under the company's chapter of incorporation, which is the American equivalent of the Articles of Association, the chances are the directors of the company will have contracted out of liability. Why does the law allow this? There are some arguably valid reasons as to why, which we'll discuss in the course. So I've just given you a kind of scattering of insights from US corporate law, really just to try and whet your appetite. But the important point to drive home from all of this is some people think of 
Anglo-American corporate law or Anglo-American corporate governance as being a valid descriptor because the US and the UK are so similar to each other legally, politically, economically. That's just not the case. The Anglo and the American are very separate from one another and very different from one another. US and UK corporate law and corporate governance are very different animals. Therefore, even if you are studying UK or English company law, there's very good reason to learn US corporate law as well. Finally, some housekeeping matters. Uh, as an outsider, uh, not usually based in Cambridge, uh, I'm not altogether familiar with the, the practicalities of, of the administration of courses. But what I will say, uh, I don't intend to have a textbook or casebook for this course. Uh, so you don't need to buy any particular book. Materials will be provided to you in advance of class and I will make electronic reading lists available uh, containing articles, uh, possibly also US cases as well because US cases I find are very, very difficult to access in Westlaw so it might be easier if possible if, if, if I somehow supply them but I'll, I'll, I'll worry about that in due course. Uh, the course, it's not been set in stone yet but uh, my provisional intention is to run the course over four days on a fortnightly basis, so every two weeks. What that means is there will be two seminars per teaching day. Now, I know you'll probably uh, balk at that suggestion, uh, but there's upsides and downsides. The downside is it is quite a tough day. There will be a break between the two seminars, I promise. Uh, it will be quite a tough day, it will be quite a slog, but the advantage is you get two weeks of seminars out of the way in one fell swoop and depending on how you like to run your timetable, that might operate to your advantage. Uh, assessment is by way of an unseen essay. Uh, my provisional intention is that you'll be required to answer three questions from at least four. Uh, they'll mainly, but not exclusively, be in the form of essay questions, uh, because uh, that tends to be more in line with how I run the seminars, that style of answering. And finally, as this is a US-related uh, course, uh, I will be employing a, what I call a semi-Socratic teaching method. Uh, anyone who's roughly familiar with the US educational system will know that the Socratic teaching method is very common, whereby students are picked upon by name to answer questions. I'm probably not going to pick people by name to answer questions, because you're all graduate students, uh, you're at a sufficient level where you're more than capable of speaking up for yourselves. Uh, but I will, however, be putting my faith in you as a class and expecting you to have an active discussion with me during class uh, and to, 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 to develop debatable issues uh, and to answer questions in class. So uh, I'm rather flexible about how the classes proceed. I'm quite happy to go off on certain tangents in different directions as long as by the end of the two hours we've covered everything we need to cover. So do be prepared to speak out. If you'd rather put your head down and take notes for two hours, probably not the right course to, to choose. Uh, and even though I'm based in London, uh, I'll usually be on hand to answer any queries by email and I'll supply my email address in due course with the uh, seminar material. So sorry for taking up so much of your time. Uh, happy to deal with any questions just now.